Okay, so part two of Stellar Characteristics and Evolution looks at the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. A very important uh, chart in astrophysics, and uh, we have to understand the Hertzsprung Russell diagram and something that comes out of that, which is the mass luminosity, well, the evidence comes out of that, which is we call the mass luminosity relation, which is described in the in the data book here. Uh, our skills involve sketching and interpreting HR diagrams, identifying the main regions, and describing the main properties of stars in those regions, and applying the mass luminosity relation. We previously looked at stellar spectra, and the two most important, uh, arguably, pieces of information we can get from the spectrum of the star are its class, O, a, B, A, F, G, K, M, uh, which basically is its surface temperature, and there's a bunch of information that comes from that, and its luminosity class. Okay, so stars can be determined in terms of their surface temperature and luminosity. Um, the other piece of information that we looked at last class, obviously, in last videos, was the composition, what the star's made out of. That's not so significant for, um, for the, the purposes of this particular diagram. We really care about the star's surface temperature and its luminosity. In terms of the surface temperature and the class of the star, the other piece of information was that the colour of the star changed. And that's important because that's very directly if we want to find the spectrum of a star, then we, we, we need to actually take its spectrum, which is a bit of an involved process. If we can just measure the colour of a star, that's a lot quicker. And although there are some, some uh, possible pitfalls, uh, it does mean we can very quickly identify the class of a star. So how do we measure its colour? We use something called the BV index. Well, there are, there are other versions, but that's probably the most common. And traditionally, you would take an image of the star um, in sort of the visual spectrum, and then you would take an image of the star just looking at the blue spectrum, and by combining the two, two results and the brightness of the star using those two results, you'd see a difference. And that difference is directly related to the colour of the star, as you can see in this chart. But just by measuring that, we can... Uh, know the class of the star, and that will also give us the surface temperature of the star, as described. Another thing that we did briefly mention is absolute magnitude. This is a, uh, you don't, under the current version of this syllabus, need to know much about absolute magnitude. Basically, all you need to know is that it is a measurement of the brightness of the star on a scale derived from something that the ancient Greeks came up with, but from a uniform distance of 10 parsecs. So it's basically related to the luminosity. The greater the luminosity, the greater the magnitude, except that magnitude, kind of weirdly, is a negative scale. So the smaller the magnitude, the brighter the star. So minus 5.4 is a very luminous star. The actual brightness as measured on Earth, of course, depends not just on the luminosity and the absolute magnitude, it depends on the distance of the star from the Earth. But, as we'll see later, that's an important relationship because if we know the luminosity, the actual power output, and we know the brightness, what we observe, then we can calculate the distance. And that is a very good thing to know. We'll come back to that later. So, the hertzsprung russell diagram. It's a diagram, it's a chart, it's a scatter plot, is what it is. On the x-axis, you have, well, both these examples have colour index, which, as I said, is a useful thing for astronomers because it's something you can directly measure. You don't have to calculate it. But it's also perfectly valid to have the stellar class because that's related to the colour and, of course, the temperature. The IB by the way, wants you to know the temperature. It will, or if you see a HR diagram or you're asked to sketch a HR diagram, which you may be, then you will have to put the label in temperature. But the key thing here is that the coolest temperatures are on the right-hand side. For historical reasons relating to, relating to the way that the 
diagram was first drawn, temperature is on the right hand side smaller. So 3000 Kelvin here up to 10 and 30,000 Kelvin on the left hand side. The y axis is made up from um, one of two different choices, really. One is the absolute magnitude that we just looked at, which is sort of a perceived brightness scale. That's a logarithmic scale because it's based on I response, which itself is logarithmic. Or you can put luminosity. Luminosity is better in some ways. It's more of an intrinsic property of the star. However, it does mean that you, again, have to use a logarithmic scale here. You don't with absolute magnitude because it is already logarithmic. But with luminosity, you must use a logarithmic scale. So 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, etc. You do all that. You plot all that. <clears throat> and as you can see in these diagrams, there isn't just a random scattering of stars. Instead, they form several clumpy areas. There's another version of that uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with actually some named example stars that you could go out and look at in the night sky, although if you wanted to see DX Cancri, I think you would need a very powerful telescope, or for that matter, white dwarfs. But again, on the x-axis, color index, temperature, or stellar class. On the y-axis, luminosity, logarithmic, or absolute magnitude. As a special bonus, these diagonal lines here are lines of constant radius. So anything along this one solar radius line, which obviously includes the sun, but also a few things a bit smaller than the sun, um, has a radius of the same size as our sun. Down here, and again this is a logarithmic scale, so this is 10 to the minus 2, or about 1% um, of the size of our sun is where we find different white dwarfs. Uh, the reason we can do that is because the surface area of a star is related by Stefan, Bo um, Stefan Boltzmann law here to the uh, L over T to the power 4. And so it's a relationship that we can nicely graph. So what are the different areas of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Well, 90% of all stars lie on this main sequence here. Main sequence stars, luminosity class 5 stars, are all adult stars burning hydrogen into helium. They're actually stars. They're fusing, um, they're using nuclear fusion to give power. But that is just the first stage, hydrogen to helium. For some stars, it's the only stage. Now, obviously, there are many differences between these stars. Every difference between stars is driven by mass. These are low mass stars and these are high mass stars. One consequence of that, again, coming from the sigma AT to the fourth relationship, is that the low mass stars actually are going to live a lot longer than the high mass stars. They are parsimonious with their use of hydrogen. They only use small amounts of of their fuel source and also because they're so small they're very convective they have big convection currents which mean all of their hydrogen is available for use <clears throat> a small mass star down here might well spend a trillion years or more converting hydrogen into helium our sun somewhere in the middle here will spend approximately eight, nine, maybe ten billion years. Ten billion years. Ten billion sounds a long time, but it's a lot less than a trillion years. The really big stars here, which technically are known as dwarves, even though they have got very high mass, although actually the size, don't forget this diagonal line, the size doesn't grow that much, just, you know, a couple of times. Uh, these technically are known as dwarves still. They are still main sequence star stars. But they will only be on the main sequence for a very short time. They burn through their fuel at prodigious rates, maybe a million years, maybe even less. But there is a relationship between the luminosity of a star and between its mass. And for the main sequence, that approximate relationship is L is proportional to m to the 3.5. What that means is that a star that is... Um, 
twice as bright as our sun will have a lot more mass than our sun. Okay, so you can find some applications of this formula because this is one of the things that the I beam leaves you to know. Above the main sequence in our chart, we have the subgiants and the giants. These are no longer main sequence stars. These are post-main sequence stars. All of these stars that are not on the main sequence are post-main sequence stars. Um, the full details will wait until um, a future unit, but suffice it to say that hydrogen into helium is no longer happening in the core. That doesn't mean it's no longer happening. It just means it's no longer happening in the core. So it happens in a shell around the core, which significantly heats up the outer envelope of the star, which makes it expand. So even though these stars have, they, they don't gain any mass in the process, in fact they're losing mass, uh, they become significantly bigger. Because they're significantly bigger, they're also significantly cooler. So we'll, as I say, we'll look at much more details of this in a later unit, but all these stars up here are giants. Supergiants, which are the largest stars that you can see, some are from luminosity of a million times the luminosity of our sun and a radius up to a thousand times the radius of our sun. This is the sort of end game for what's already a large mass star when it moves off the main sequence and grows. Red supergiants, remember these diagonal lines representing size, red supergiants are the largest stars currently in existence. On the other Part of the scale down here, we have the white dwarfs. White dwarfs have a very low luminosity, but they do have a very high temperature. Okay, so by this equation, if they have a high value of T, but yet a very low value of L, they must also have a very low value of A. These are very, 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 very small objects. These are stars, which are some of them the mass of our sun or more, um, actually, technically, they're not stars because they're no longer undergoing nuclear fusion. They're stellar remnants. Uh, but e they're still glowing because they're really hot. And even though they have very high temperatures, they have very low luminosities because of their very small size. Uh, probably about the size of the Earth, most white dwarf stars. Another area of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram you should be familiar with, amongst these other parts that we've mentioned, uh, is this area called the instability strip. These stars are again stars nearing the end of their lives and which due to a combination of their composition and their size and their temperature are variable. They vary in brightness and they vary in brightness, they vary in luminosity uh, by varying in size actually. Uh, the full details you don't really need to know but basically there's a, a feedback process where the star tries to maintain its hydrostatic equilibrium, but it fails. <clears throat> Parts of the star absorb energy, and as they absorb energy, they get hotter. As they get hot, hotter, they expand, which causes those parts to change to another form, which doesn't absorb energy, so it contracts, which means that it got hotter, which etc., etc., etc. As I say, look at the links in the, in the web pages for more information if you want it. And... The application of some of these variable stars is very interesting. So that was um, a basic introduction to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. One application of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is to actually find the distance to star. Because if you look at a stellar spectra, you know the temperature and you know the luminosity class. You know, is it a uh, white dwarf, is it a dwarf, is it a subgiant, etc. <coughs> and you can use this information here. You find the spectral type from the temperature. Okay, it's an A8 star, but is it an A8V star, or is it an A81 star, or 5 class 5 star, or class 1 star? Um, you find that information from the spectral lines, and therefore you know it's luminous. Spectrum of the star gives you the luminosity class, gives you the spectral class, combine that information in the hertzsprung russell diagram to give you the luminosity. As I said earlier, if you know how bright the star really is, and you know how bright it, you can see it, what its brightness is as measured here on Earth, you can combine that by this equation, the distance equals the square root of the luminosity of the star divided by 4 pi times the brightness of the star, and that will give you the distance to 
interesting information. Okay, thank you very much.